This is a tube that grants wishes. Specifically, wishes for things that can fit in this box. So a tube that allows people to deliver things directly into your home? Kind of like a mail slot, but different. Why do this? First of all, who doesn't love tubes? Mac, how did you like the donuts? Second of all, how terrible is it that we drive everything everywhere? If I want a six pack of chicken nuggets, I gotta get a human being in a two-ton car to go get that single item. The way we make delivery work right now is bonkers. Why not use small electric robots to just get stuff right into our homes? Something can just appear in a drawer. It's just kind of a magical experience and it feels as close to teleportation as I think we're gonna get. These tubes are like a more adaptable version of the pneumatic tubes in old-timey banks and department stores, but they can connect any home with any store or restaurant. We flipped the problem of last mail delivery on its head. Most other modalities are trying to create a robot that can adapt to any environment. We're doing the opposite. We're trying to create an environment and adapt that to any city. This isn't life imitating Mario Brothers. It's called hyper-logistics, and it could be the future of how we move stuff around. We agree. It is very, very tough. And by no means think this is a 100% chance we're going to make this happen. But I mean, we're going to spend the next decade trying. So uh, it is a pipe dream. So how will magic tubes change your life? No, Mario, not you. Oh, come on. This is Hard Reset, a series about rebuilding our world from scratch. Here to see a man about some tubes. See a lot of tubes over here. This this seems like the tube place. How's it going? Good. How's it going? I'm Nick Cannon. Nice to meet you. Nice Thanks to meet for you. having us. Come on in. All right. I heard you got some tubes. Oh, we got a few. This is Pipe Dream a new hardware company developing a network of underground tunnels that will allow robots to deliver packages directly into homes. The idea of building a citywide network of tubes that connect to every house and apartment seems crazy, until you realize we already do this. It's called plumbing, and it's pretty standard stuff in developed areas. This is the same idea, but with bigger tubes that can accommodate more kinds of stuff. In the same way that you have a gas pipe and a water pipe to your house, we're trying to create the thing pipe to your home. That's Ken. He's the co-founder of Pipe Dream, and he's been building robots like the ones that go inside these tubes since high school, including some cage fighting robots. Right? Right, Cannon? No battle bots. I wish I could have. Yeah. Oh. It's never too late. <laughs> well, we'll just have to wait for the Pipe Dream sponsored battle bot then. Anyways. So tell me a little bit about what you have here. This looks like a bunch of, like almost like a museum? Yeah, this is the graveyard of prototypes past. These are all the robots we created and iterated past mm -hmm. since then. This is the first robot generation where we were experimenting with the rail. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can notice, it's a lot bigger, a lot boxier, and this is a lot easier from a manufacturing perspective. The thing that makes Pipe Dream difficult is not the robot. The robot is actually really simple. It's kind of like a model train. The thing that makes it difficult is that you're building a utility, a network that can adapt to ever-changing and always different cities, installs in different restaurants, locations. And so making a system that is very modular, very robust, and designed to fail in the correct way, where you don't have to go up and go and dig the pipes up just to fix that failure. The thought experiment we use is that the sewage system exists, it's largely the same, and if there's enough money in the world to put in a system that just delivers poop, we could probably find the money <laughs> to put in a system that delivers everything else. That's Garrett. He's the CEO of Pipe Dream, and when other kids were focused on video games and toys, he was strangely obsessed with how things were delivered. I've been obsessed with Lost My Logistics my whole life. I remember the first time I used Postmates, and I got like goosebumps. I just hit a button on my iPhone, someone just brought me this coffee. It's like the most magical thing I've ever experienced. And he's been chasing that feeling ever since. It was like, that is the thing that we want to obsess over for a decade. Take that big shot. 
Last mile logistics refers to the final phase of transporting goods. When something is created in another country, it usually hops onto a boat, is taken to a port, and then to a distribution center or a retail store. From there to your house is last mile logistics. This last step in the journey is usually the shortest, but also the most expensive by far. It's crazy that something is created overseas and still like 30% of the cost of that thing is in the last mile delivery. There was a missing piece in automated logistics. That first inch, the last inch. This idea of getting goods not just to your house, but into your house is a step beyond last mile logistics. It's sometimes called last inch logistics or hyper logistics. Hyper logistics is a state of logistics where you can have something delivered in under 10 minutes to your home or business. And just as easy as you can receive from the network, you can send back out. And so we build the hard infrastructure to make going into buildings really easy, going out of buildings really easy, and also solve some of those harder long stretches in cities, the longer middle mile that needed a high volume, high speed, high safety method that didn't exist by moving stuff from place to place through underground infrastructure. Right now, we solve these logistics problems by just having a human walk stuff up to your door, which is nice, but it requires transporting the human along with all the stuff, which usually requires a multi-ton vehicle. That's not so nice. There's an environmental impact and it causes congestion and traffic. And also think about how much human creativity and potential is tied up in just driving trucks in circles and walking boxes to and from your front door. Plus, humans can't get the stuff into your house without you being there. So now we have porch pirates, a whole new genre of petty crime that spawned an entire genre of glitter bomb videos by Mark Rober. I think we always discount how much our lives change when goods or data move quicker. When Amazon started two-day shipping, people were like, I, do people need two-day shipping? When you can get goods more efficiently, that means you're spending less money on them, you get them right when you need them, there's less waste. And if the idea of things coming directly into your house is a bit weird to you, remember we already do that as well. Mail slots, for example. The big difference here is that mail slots are accessible to everyone who can walk up to your house. But the tube is only accessible to the tube lords. If tube lords is not an official title or a registered trademark yet, someone should probably hop on that. Anyway. Our goal is to take the current mail standards and double or triple the safety on them. So right now, I can look up your address and I can send you anything I want and you don't have a say in it. So what we want to do is take that one step farther and make sure that you always opt in to who can send you things so that there's never a delivery that you didn't order making its way to your home. All of this might seem as simple as an RC car in a tube, but it's really a lot harder than that. This is where we build a lot of our prototypes, assemble it all together, and, and do some testing. Stop the presses. Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay, all right. Sorry, you were saying? <laughs> there are two big engineering problems in Pipedream. One is the underground system, and the other is the above ground system. The underground side of things might seem like the most intimidating, but it turns out there's already a lot of established technology in this area. We use the same construction methods, the same materials, the same regulatory as water and sewage pipes. Sizing the pipe was the hardest thing that we had to decide on because it's the one thing that was a protocol lock on the system. Once you start using that size, super hard to use a different size. We kind of found this happy medium at the 18 inch internal diameter pipe where it wasn't significantly harder than the other sizes we were looking at, but it seemed to unlock this kind of magical size that fits most Amazon items, most of the stuff you'd buy at the grocery store, all your kind of food items. And so at this current size, that captures 99.2% of e-commerce items. Once you've got the tubes and the robots, you just need to get them into the house, which is where things get interesting. Once you start to take a tote from underground to above ground, you enter this world of infinite possibilities. There's always a need for a different kind of portal, be it a home appliance that looks really clean and good with this interior aesthetic, or something made for the back of house in a restaurant that can do really high volume. And so we've taken an approach of creating modular internal components and giving ourselves the ability to quickly change the exterior of a portal. So what's it like to have another tube in our life? The only way to find out is to build it. 
iTunes. This is Peachtree Corners, a technology park outside Atlanta where companies can build and test new infrastructure technologies. I got a phone call probably a little over a year ago, and he's like, hey, I got this crazy idea. We want to put pipe in your right-of-way underground to do delivery robots. And I was like, sounds cool. Not sure that will ever happen. Yeah, fast forward, you know, a nine, ten months, so here we are, and pipe's in the ground. That's Brandon Branham. He's the innovation lead here at Peachtree. That's some nice alliteration you got there, Brandon. Yes. Thanks, Mom, Brandon Branham. <laughs> anyway, the folks at Pipedream were able to build a functioning prototype of their tube system here that runs underground for one mile. We didn't want it to be too long, but we wanted it to be long enough that we were really learning something. Right. Um, that was a significant distance. It kind of takes into account kind of everything we would encounter in a city. This is going into an office building. We're dealing with a landlord over there. Over there, we're going into a retail center. We're going through a parking lot. All these little tiny little details that you deal with when you know you're putting something into a city. Has there been any complaints from the Mole Kingdom or <laughs> any of the uh, the Morlocks? Oh, uh, we haven't heard anything. No, I think right. uh, either they're good or they're prepping one heck of a lawsuit. <laughs> right. <laughs> putting something like this into the ground isn't wild new technology. It's roughly the same as how we install water mains. Once we kind of got past the novel idea of underground delivery, why don't we look at this just like a normal utility? Can it be done where there's already roads, where there's already massive sewer and stormwater infrastructure? And what's been cool to see is, yeah, you can do it. They do it day in and day out on other projects. So it's just getting past wanting to say no to something new and saying yes. Part of the stigma around underground is you only see underground infrastructure being put in when it interrupts your life. There are now all kinds of ways to install underground infrastructure, and not just the big tunneling machines from the boring company. There are things like horizontal directional drills and jack and bore techniques that make it way easier to put these tubes anywhere you need them. First time I saw the robot running, they told me it would carry a cup of coffee. I said, not gonna happen. It's, it's bumping around too much in there. But when, you, when I really got to see it make that run, it really starts to show that this is possible. Like when you see that thing and running through on the camera system and then it comes into the building, you're like, all right, I think we're, we're almost there. We also control the acceleration and the jerk of the robot. And so we know that when we're carrying a payload, we're not gonna hit turns at higher speeds. We also maintain the orientation of the tote at all times. It's very easy to optimize how gentle that load is and that transportation is for that tote. At their headquarters in Austin, they've got a working prototype of what this might look like in a house. So it feels like we were standing in the kitchen of the future, as according to Pipe Dream. There's just this magical box where anything I want connects to this tube down here, gets to my house, brings it up to me, and then whatever I want is in this box. Absolutely. You magnificent bastard. This prototype demonstrates how a tote can be pulled up into a home terminal from below ground. But at Peachtree Corners, their first commercial test, they've also had to engineer solutions for retrieving the tote from above. You know, we talk a lot about an underground system and we're looking at a system that goes above our heads right here. Right. Which is kind of the opposite of a lot of what we designed for. So we had to figure out how to take an underground system, bring it up above our heads, and then also get those packages out over the pipe, down, and then back down to where you can actually pick it up. This experience is meant to feel like magic. You open the drawer and whatever you desired is found within. To be clear, airplanes, trains, and trucks would still move material over very large distances. No one's planning on building a tube connection between California and Maine. But once a delivery is within range, something like this tube system could be more efficient for individual deliveries. We've got an Amazon distribution center in the city. There's 110 trucks that roll out of there every morning. There's 110 cars clogging streets, moving packages that are probably going in a four to five mile radius. 
Why not do that underground and get those trucks off the road? The UPS, FedEx, Amazon trucks, they deliver here six times a day. And that's just the big deliveries. Now we start to think about the small food delivery. We've got all this traffic coming in. So as we start to think about what Pipe Dream is doing, you're able to move things more efficiently because you're not sitting in traffic. You're not sitting at that stoplight. It really starts to reshape the mobility options that are available. This idea might still sound well, like a pipe dream to you because it is ambitious to think about installing tubes like this to every home or office. But just because something is improbable doesn't mean it's impossible. We took this thing that had a 0% chance of ever being possible and through a ton of work and a ton of super late nights, all-nighters, uh, sacrifice, we have turned that into a 2% chance of working. I think like what we're at right now is, is we've proven that you can do it, but we need to prove that you can scale it and that it can be something that's providing value to customers such that it is worth scaling massively in cities. But keep in mind that at the beginning of the 20th century, most homes still didn't have indoor plumbing. That means at one point, someone had to install tubes to all those houses. In other words, we've done this exact thing before. If they retrofitted before and they're still retrofitting today, why can't you retrofit a pipe into your house for delivery systems and return systems? Can I think long term, as we build out the infrastructure, getting into people's homes, and I could be wrong, but I really think it's one of those things where it's like, man, how did we live without this? So picture a scenario where most homes had an instant delivery tube installed. As more and more delivery services become autonomous, this tube would act as an all-purpose conduit for the robots that shuttle things around. Because if you can make it super easy, you can receive items in a drawer in your home, which is, is kind of our holy grail. That's great. But if you can accept items and send them back, then we end up in a world where we don't have to have all this stuff around us. Having near instant access to most goods could change everything about our daily lives, like how we spend our time or even how we build our homes. So this comes into my house and I can order my groceries, my dinner for that night and it's there in 20 minutes. Do I need a big refrigerator that's sucking a ton of energy from my home 24 seven hours a day? Or does that change? Is it more like that walkable city where I walked by the grocery store on my way home? Now do I get a package that I traditionally had to go and return to a store at Amazon and get in my car and drive to that return? Or can I now start to use this for a return process? Could we store all our stuff off-site and have them delivered on demand via tube to free up space in our homes? Would our belongings be available to us everywhere, the way our data in the cloud is now? Beyond just storage, instant access to shared commodities begins to make a lot more sense. For example, let's say you didn't own a specific tool, like a sander. You could just rent one, have it delivered in a few minutes, and return it, as opposed to accumulating a bunch of tools in your garage that you may or may not ever use again. And not only am I spending less money on tools, I have access to higher quality tools for less money. The world also doesn't need to put as much resources into creating those tools. So you get to this really interesting world where consumerism and environmentalism aren't in conflict anymore. On a related note, if anyone would like to borrow this sander that I have used exactly twice, let me know and I'll see if I can send it to you via tube. With all the emerging delivery services we may see in the future, we're beginning to create a logistics system for physical objects that begins to resemble what the internet is for information. I think people are going to be really surprised as autonomous logistics, as an industry, comes more online, how much we're using that. It's kind of like the internet. Like, you know, when the internet comes online, then there's not a lot of websites, and you're kind of like, oh, what, what do I use this for? And then all of a sudden, we put all this knowledge on it. There's services on top of it. Um, the internet creates industries. I think in the same way, autonomous logistics and that cost dropping down so drastically so quick is going to create so many businesses that we can't even consider right now that are just gonna change the way that we live. I can't help but notice you guys have a lot of boxes. We get a lot of boxes. I can't help but wonder, wouldn't it be nice if you had like a, some sort of uh, tube-based delivery system for all your boxes where you could like store all your stuff? That'd be wonderful. If only somebody would work on that. I just... It seems like a pipe dream.